uh, attending an event on Algerian on North African energy is probably not the most fun event around on a Friday evening. But thanks for showing interest and thanks for coming. Uh, so I would just like to briefly introduce the organizations that made this event happen. So uh, Algerian Solidarity <coughs> Campaign, which organized the event, and SOAS Pan African Society, which kindly accepted to host the event and help organizing it. Uh, so yeah, Algerian Solidarity Campaign is a London-based organization. Um, it was created three years ago. Uh, it, aims, um, it was mainly inspired by the events of the Arab Spring and it campaigns for respect of human rights and democratic change in Algeria. Uh, it also aims at providing a platform for debate and uh, exchanging ideas on issues that faces Algerian people. Uh, SOAS Pan-African Society for its part is a, an active society at SOAS uh, which aims at cultivating knowledge on African history and African politics. It also aims at discussing issues uh, that African people face both in the continent and abroad. Uh, it also works at celebrating African uh, rich and diverse culture uh, which also includes North African culture which is quite often excluded from African debates. Uh, so yeah, I guess we can start the talk. But before that, I would like to introduce our chair tonight, Mr. Charles Richard. Uh, he's a, a writer and uh, an advisor on North African and Middle Eastern affairs. Uh, he, used to, he covered uh, the region in the 80s and 90s. And he was also an advisor for BP, which actually has quite significant investment in Algeria. So, yeah, that's all. Enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here just to introduce Francis. And uh, <coughs> my qualification for that is that we first met in Cairo in the early 80s. And uh, we were both working for the Financial Times at the time. And then when I first when I made my first trip to Algeria, Francis helped me enormously to try and understand the place. And I once made a mistake, as most journalists did at that time, to describe Algerian, the Algerian system as opaque, very difficult to understand, very shadowy. And he said that was lazy and a journalistic cliche. And actually, Algeria was difficult to understand, but not impossible. If you worked hard, you could try and uh, determine who was who in the pouvoir and what their different policies were. So I never called Algeria opaque again. I might think it's opaque, but I've been mindful never to use that term. And what Francis taught me and taught most of us is that if you do work on your sources and you try and delve deep, you do understand that any system is penetrable. You can begin to understand who makes decisions and on what basis and what the different policies might be. And in that, he may not be unique, but he's certainly one of the very few people, so, uh, certainly writing in the West, um, who can explain Algeria in an interesting, intelligible, and coherent way. So I'm delighted to introduce him. Um, he Jean seems to think that oil and gas is not an interesting subject. It's always an interesting subject. It's a very it's it's all about power and money, and so it's a fascinating topic. Um, you will talk for about 35-40 minutes, then I'll cut you off, and then we'll have time for questions. We're a smallish group, so we uh, normally say, let's have short questions, but we can, we've got time for a proper discussion. One last thing, uh, health and safety. There is no planned fire alarm tonight, so if a fire alarm goes, you go either left or right out the door. Uh, wheelchair is to the right. And I know there's some stairs, stone stairs just to the left, so um, uh, if you hear an alarm, move swiftly. Francis. Well, thank you very much, uh, Charles. Uh, <clears throat> as the title of the, uh, the uh, talk suggests, I wasn't planning to speak only on Algeria, but I suppose the focus will be concentrated on Algeria and maybe Libya, actually. So I'll start with the two extremes uh, geographically and move to the centre. <coughs> I don't think about Egypt, as, as you may know, um, uh, the 
Egypt has been an exporter of gas, not a major one. The events of the last year or so have reduced its capacity to export exports to Israel have ceased. The exports to the US have slowed down a lot and a number of terminals are closed and all that, but at the moment unpaid bills to oil and gas companies are apparently being paid again, so activity is reviving, but I won't dwell further on Egypt because it's not a major player in terms of exporters. If I go to the other end of the Maghreb, uh, Morocco today, Morocco does not produce any oil or gas, but uh, there are more, uh, there's more research going on for oil and gas, so more permits been given in Morocco in the last two or three years than ever before, and uh, companies are drilling off the coast of Morocco, in Morocco, so the future will tell whether they're lucky or not. But, um, and uh, Morocco, in terms of energy, uh, imports much of its energy, oil and gas. <coughs> when it comes to gas, it imports some gas from Algeria in the form of royalties on the pipeline, which takes Algerian gas to the Iberian Peninsula. It's got a second contract over and above that with Algeria, not big amounts. <clears throat> and it is negotiating a third contract. Uh, in other respects, in terms of gas, it plans to build a regasification plant to import <coughs> gas from countries other than Algeria um, on the northern coast uh, at Nador. And otherwise, in terms of energy, Morocco has launched uh, in recent years a very bold, a very ambitious program uh, to develop renewable energy, which has had a lot of support from Europe, from the World Bank and so on. And so Morocco is trying to diversify its sources. Uh, but of course, uh, in a logical world, um, Morocco would buy far more gas from Algeria because it needs the gas um, for its industry, not, not least for its phosphate industry to make fertilizers. But relations being what they are with Algeria, I suppose one should, one should just consider it's lucky that Morocco does use and import some Algerian gas. Um, if I then move to the other end, to Libya, well, Libya is a story unto its own, since, as you probably know, the production of oil and gas is not completely stopped, but it has come very close to a halt in the last uh, three or four months, both the production and the exports. Um, how long this will go on is, I'm, uh, I, I don't care to make any um, uh, forecast about this, because uh, in view of the nature of the armed groups and the different militias in Libya, I think it's anybody's guess as to how long uh, this is going to last. Because so far, the oil and gas facilities have not been damaged. But of course, any further expansion of Western companies working in Libya is at the moment on hold. And as I say, it's, I mean, uh, I'm not going to even pretend forecasting uh, <coughs> Libya. Uh, which I do not know all that well, except that it is out of the game. Now, Libya produces uh, the same type of uh, oil, sweet oil, as Algeria, which has very little sulfur, but you know, sulfur in it. And therefore, there is a tension uh, in terms of supplies, because uh, although Libya accounts for, I think, one or two percent of oil production, it's not much, it doesn't affect the prices too, too much. But on this particular blend, uh, Saharan blend, or whatever it's called, Saharan sweet, uh, it does affect the feedstock of certain industries, but it's manageable. The gas pipeline at the moment, as far as I know, to Italy is closed off. It was closed off last winter. It doesn't affect the Italians too badly because the Italians, because of the uh, recession, have less need for gas than uh, uh, they had signed up for uh, in, in, in recent years. And so they couldn't have made use of some of the Russian gas, which is taken pay courses, we've got to pay for it even if you don't use it or whatever. So in fact, it's been quite convenient for them that the Libyans were unable to send gas last winter and at the moment because they actually don't need it. So in other words, it hasn't disrupted things in any grand way. Um, if we come to Tunisia, Tunisia is a modest producer of oil and gas. It's uh, contrary to Morocco, it has on the whole had reasonably good relations with Algeria and it has taken a fair amount of its gas leads off the gas pipeline over and above the royalties. Um, this continues. Uh, what's going on in Tunisia has not affected uh, those policies or that uh, the problem at all. 
the only thing which is being, which is slowed down by the by the nature of the government in Tunisia today is that the renewable energy projects are not moving really very much in the last two years and uh, there again this could uh, this will change the day there is a new government in Tunisia or at least uh, if there are new elections and a more solid government which can take decisions uh, but there again this does not affect the supply of energy overall. Um, we are left then with the in a sense the biggest boy in the field at the moment, uh, Algeria. Algeria faces today uh, some, uh, some difficult problems. It's, it's a big producer, so obviously it's not Saudi Arabia, one of the really big ones, but it is an important producer of oil, particularly gas. Uh, Algeria was the first country in the world where Shell, as it were, built a liquefaction nat natural gas plant, the first ever in the world in 1961 60. Uh, four, so it was, it was actually built, the building started before Algeria became independent and the first shipment of gas, of liquefied natural gas ever in the world was from Arzu in Western Algeria to the Cam Cambi Island in the Thames and Algeria has been a pioneer in this with obviously the help of many other international players, Japanese, English, American uh, and Algeria has, part of Algeria's exports of uh, gas has been in the form of LNG since 1963 and um, essentially to Europe, it used to be some to the states but then that stopped a long time ago and um, on the whole it's been a reliable supplier, there's been no particular problem, there have been arguments about prices but I mean basically it's been a reliable supplier of gas since the first shipment to London in 1963. Uh, the gas other than in LNG form, the gas uh, goes by pipeline. The first pipeline to Italy, which was the first underwater, I think, gas pipeline in the world, if I'm right, was completed in 1983. It's been increased in size. It's functioned perfectly well. Uh, it carries, I think, it's 28 billion cubic feet. It's quite, a, 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 but it's always functioned. Uh, there's been no particular problem. There've been no problems with the Tunisians. Uh, there's a whole structure of ownership, of management of it, which was, um, which was invented by the Indy people and it, it functions, uh, um, it functions um, perfectly well. <coughs> Nothing particular to say on, on that front. Uh, with Morocco, when the second pipeline uh, built, uh, completed in the late 1990s, crossing Morocco, um, that was a bit more difficult, not in terms of the technical problems, um, except that, of course, uh, the Strait of Gibraltar is far deeper than the Strait of Sicily, but in both cases this was Italian technology, this was Saipem technology, and uh, it worked very well in technological terms, it was brilliant, but um, the, Mor the, uh, the Moroccans insisted on first uh, taking royalties which were higher in percentage of the throughput of gas than the Tunisians for whatever reason and they also strongly objected to Algeria being the joint owner of the underwater part of the gas pipeline which is the case in Italy where the underwater part of the pipeline between uh, northern Tunisia and Sicily is a joint Algeria uh, Italian uh, venture where the part of the pipeline on Tunisian soil has a Tunisian uh, sort of uh, share of the capital. Um, about 10 years ago, and it goes back to 2003, 2004, my memory doesn't serve me perfectly, the Moroccans for the first time asked the Algerians who wanted to buy more gas off the uh, Western pipeline, the Duran Farel pipeline. Uh, the Algerians refused whether it was a fit of peak. What was sure was that at the time, Moroccans were very fond of saying that Algeria, they couldn't buy more gas from Algeria for many years because Algeria was an unreliable supply, at least for them. And uh, so when they first asked to buy more gas, they would be buffed. Then things calmed down, as usual, with Algeria and Morocco. And uh, two years ago, or two and a half years ago, a new contract was signed whereby Morocco buys extra billion cubic meters worth of gas every year. And there is now, despite uh, a recent sort of diplomatic spat between the two countries, as usual on the Western Sahara, um, they are negotiating uh, a second contract to buy some more gas from Algeria. Um, 
and you know, sort of business continues, maybe not as usual, but business continues beyond the shouting and uh, despite the shouting. Um, Algeria itself today faces a number of major challenges in how it develops its oil and gas industry. Um, <clears throat> exports of oil and gas have dropped by about 15% this year due to a number of reasons, not least the recession in Europe. Um, and um, there have been a number of debates, uh, sort of, um, you know, which, are, which sort of tend to crisscross in Algeria and get rather confused. One of the debates is purely internal. Algerian oil products and gas and petrol are some of the cheapest in the world. A million, a million um, BTU of gas in Algeria, or is it a million BTU? <coughs> on that one, costs half a dollar, which must be the cheapest in the world for so domestic consumption. And since gas is used to produce electricity, and the consumption of electricity is going up by 10, 12 percent a year, so this is untenable in the long, in the medium term, that if Algeria does not increase its domestic prices of gas, because gas is wasted in a, in a good way, it's the same, uh, the subsidies there, you can calculate the subsidies, and the, the subsidies now, it doesn't mean saying you have the Algerian authority would have to bring the price of gas up to the price that may be in Italy or France or Europe, nonetheless, to have such cheap gas leads to enormous wastage in its use inside Algeria. Um, the second product uh, where the wastage is, where it's not the wastage, it's the smuggling, is petrol. Petrol is, uh, in Algeria, is um, one quarter of the price of which we use one third of Morocco, or one quarter of Morocco, and one eighth of what it is in Europe. The result is that the smuggling of petrol at the frontiers between Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia has just grown and grown and grown. It's now reached the stage where the authorities are having to denounce the smuggling, but of course it's their policy which has induced it in the first place. And uh, <coughs> earlier this summer, last summer, the Minister of Energy and the Minister of the Interior uh, publicly complained, and, uh, and the figures that came out, which one knew, were that an equivalent of $1.2 billion worth of petrol um, were smuggled into Morocco and Tunisia every year. And anybody who goes to Tunisia's western frontier can see these huge jerry cans or things of petrol piled up in the middle of town, you know, like anything, because it is much cheaper than uh, Tunisian petrol. So this is a problem where the subsidies, the internal subsidies, and this doesn't only happen on petrol, it happens on uh, sugar, it happens on other products. If you subsidize the product in the country next door, doesn't or does so less, inevitably the product leaks. But um, it's quite funny at the Algerian Moroccan frontier because today, if you go to the western Algerian town of Clemson, you have to get up at six in the morning to fill your tank, which is rather extraordinary. And meanwhile, these lorries, or these tankers, whatever they call in English, full of petrol, oil, of, uh, petrol, just cross the frontier and they go and come. And one has to assume this complicity high up. It's not just donkeys carrying a few sort of jerry cans. Oh, it's just huge lawyers, and they're going and coming. Fish in the frontiers close, you know, the press insult each other, the leaders say all kinds of things. Uh, and this is, a, this is a major problem. Algeria is having to import some products now, refined products, because it can't produce enough because it's leaking to Morocco. So it's a completely absurd situation. Now, the reason given in private by the authorities for not wanting to do anything is that they want to keep the social peace. They're worried about what might happen if they increase the prices, which is fine, except that, uh, you know, obviously from the outside, the IMF, the World Bank, the usual suspects are pushing for an increase in prices, but the simple fact of the matter is when you add up all the figures, the policy can't last forever. At one point, something's going to have to be done. What, when, anybody's, anybody's guess, but every year that goes by, every month that goes by, the problem gets worse, the wastage gets worse. And this is, uh, as I said, this is true of petroleum products, but it's also true of uh, some other um, you know, food products and so on and so forth. If one turns to the outside, the Algerians, as all oil and gas producers, uh, tend to policy varies in terms of conditions meted out to foreign companies uh, for their 
research and exploitation of oil and gas. And um, when the prices of oil or gas are high, obviously the producing countries tend to impose more stringent conditions. When the prices are low, they tend to be more, uh, more lenient, more, uh, more flexible, and it's, uh, it's not easy. And in the case of Algeria, they have been particularly uh, tough in their conditions, and so uh, two or three years ago when they had their last round of bidding, virtually nobody bid for the contracts. This winter there's a new round of bidding. We'll see whether things have, uh, the conditions have been improved. Whether they've been improved enough to attract big players is anybody's guess at this stage. I really don't know. Um, but this brings us one back to two other things about Algeria. One is the attack against the oil field of Tigen Turin or the broader field of Inaminas in January, which has caused a serious problem for Algeria because uh, I don't know whether. And the last time, last time oil or gas field was taken over literally for, for a week in the Middle East. Has it happened? I mean, it probably it hasn't happened in Iraq or <coughs> Iran. I think it's, I don't, so I can't, it, I can't. And it really, I mean, you know, it wasn't. Now, uh, I don't know any name in us personally. I know other guys. Kuwait invaded by Kuwait. Oh, when, when Saddam Hussein said first, yes. But that's, so maybe it was the first time that the gas field was actually take, taken over for a, for a week or ten days when it lasted. It looks more than embarrassing, it really looks, uh, it looks bad. Uh, why the failure, I mean, trying to analyze why the Algerian security uh, failed to spot it. Uh, I, I don't have the elements, and I, I don't know whether the, anybody who's done any work, I mean, Stato, one of the two companies with BP, who were very involved in developing the field, have produced a, a report which I have not seen them, I've seen the public part of Amazon, the private part. And so I, I don't know exactly. At any rate, it was a major failure on the Algerian side. <coughs> and uh, whether it was a failure on the oil company side as well, maybe. I, I'm, not sort of, you know, I'm, I'm not in a position to say. But of course, the result was that the two companies pulled out of uh, <coughs> those oil field, that gas field, and have not really gone back in time. They've got some personal back, but they haven't fully resumed work in it. And the Algerians are always very reticent to speak about security or to open up to their foreign partners. And uh, in this case, uh, obviously, if you do not, if you're too reticent, uh, and you fail to convince uh, major oil companies, this has a kind of trickle down effect on the whole industry because uh, whatever the Algerians may think of the fear that BP and Statoil, the fact of the matter is that these people and the Japanese lost the biggest contingent of foreigners. Those who were faced with that want to know more. They want to understand what the Algerians are up to, have they improved their a security, what is a decision making process? And as always in Algiers, uh, many Algerians feel this is either sort of state secrets they shouldn't be spoken about, but if you want to build trust, you've got to be more open. So <clears throat> that problem is not entirely sorted out, and it certainly has cast a pale on the rest of the industry because um, <clears throat> although the oil and gas fields, and the major ones, the Hassi Miso and the Hassi Amel, are way in Algeria, they're a long way from the frontier, so it's very difficult to imagine a raid on Hassi Saud or Hassi Armel. Nonetheless, in Aminas happened. <coughs> the Algerians have made efforts, but clearly in the eyes of many companies, they're not sufficient. And then this, this cuts across the policy of is Algeria going to loosen the rules a bit more, uh, to encourage more companies to get involved in Algeria, it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time also because Algeria is still paying the price of <coughs> the what happened, this corruption scandal which saw the Minister of Energy, who was one of the most powerful men in the country, be pushed out in 2009. Some of the leading uh, leaders of the oil company, some of the major vice presidents of the national oil company, Sonatrack, were put under house arrest for corruption. This had never happened in Algiers before. Um, 
in Algiers, the, the companies, Solid Track and the ministers, over the years, I'm not going to claim they're all totally honest, but I mean, by and large, the business wasn't badly run. What happened to money once again in South Africa is a completely different question. But one thing the former minister, Mr. Shaki Khalil, had done when he came to the ministry in 1999, instead of having the money, all the receipts for oil and gas and everything to do with hydrocarbons come into one account in a bank in Algeria, the Banque Sociale d'Algerie, and then into the central bank, he set up an account in London and some of the receipts, not the majority of it, some of the receipts of the oil and gas, went to that account. And then they came to Algeria, so of course that opened the floodgate to all kinds of uh, all kinds of affairs of corruption and um, <coughs> accusations or uh, well um, accus for the moment libel. for the moment their accusations, but uh, I think that uh, money has gone sideways now. In any case, it's in front of the court. What will come out of that? What will be able to know exactly what? Uh, the, but the, the result of all this, um, of all this um, episode is that uh, in Solar Track today, decisions take much, much, much longer than they did a few years ago because everybody is looking over his shoulder, nobody dares take a decision, uh, and every decision is pushed up. It all ends up on the table of the minister. The minister there since the last three years, Mr. Lucy, is a man who's competent, and to the best of my knowledge, I and mean, I've known him for 30 years, I think, he, I think he's clean. But the fact of the matter is he's faced with any number of decisions which he shouldn't be taken, they should be taken further down the ladder. And this, of course, makes life very difficult because Sonatrack is a big company. It's got interest joint ventures all over the place. It's, it's a big, complex company. And uh, so, the, the fallout of the Shakib Khalil uh, period <coughs> is still being felt. Now, to explain the, <coughs> beyond the corruption the scandal, there is another aspect of the oil policy of Algeria in the first decade, if you will, of the 21st century, which I think bears telling. Uh, in the 1990s, during uh, the bitter civil war in Algeria, Algeria was ostracized by a number of Western powers, there's no doubt. Flights, were, many flights were cancelled, you couldn't get visas, and it was a very difficult period. Uh, <clears throat> in 2001, uh, on the 11th of September, none other than the chief and the head of security of Algeria happened to be at the Pentagon when the Pentagon was attacked. Uh, of course, that gave him, and you can understand him seizing the opportunity, the perfect argument with um, Donald Rumsfeld. Well, there you are, you know, you speak about our dirty war against uh, Islamists. Well, now you've got it, so let's see how you deal with it, and maybe we can give you a few lessons. And this allowed Algeria to sort of be invited back into forums where it had been shunned for 10 years. Uh, and the Americans were very keen for all kinds of reasons that Algeria should push its production of, um, of oil, should uh, have you know, a sort of more, a more open system in terms of foreigners' bidding, should open up the system, liberalize it, the usual story. And so four years later, Mr. Khalil produced a blueprint, a new hydrocarbons law. At that moment, Within the Algerian establishment, uh, the, the knives came out because a number of people, and irrespective of who they were politically, just said, well, uh, we can't have laws which are as rules which are as liberal as this. It's just sending our country to foreigners, and they're, they're, they're perfectly respectable people, and they weren't just uh, you know, hardline nationalists. Or we, but this is just unacceptable. The minister and the president didn't pay much attention, but then two funny things happened. The king of Saudi Arabia rang the Algerian president and just said to him, you can't do this. So there's no way you can get this legislation passed. I, I find this totally unacceptable to be. The funniest episode which, which went largely unreported was President Putin flew to Algeria on a state visit. Gets to Algiers, is greeted in the Salon d'honneur at the airport, and all the Algerian leadership is there, including the head of security, of course. And, uh, you know, beginning a state visit in a few days. 
and uh, to the Algerians' great surprise, he starts lecturing them on the law. And uh, it goes on and on and on, and he says this new law is unacceptable. And if you pass this law, I'm going to ask to buy 15%. We, Russia or Gazprom, whoever it is, we, uh, we'll buy 15% of some track. But this law is quite unacceptable. It's going to destroy our gas policy, something. And he salutes the president, gets back on the plane, and leaves Algiers. The state visit is literally cancelled on there. Uh, this kind of episode is, is quite extraordinary. Then Chavez comes into the scene and wants the scene and does his usual surface. But I mean, basically, what the king of Saudi Arabia, what Putin did, or what mattered, that suggested this legislation was, in, was running into trouble. And then, uh, between 2005, the legislation was shelved, and finally it was, uh, it was uh, you know, abandoned. And this pointed to a debate which doesn't go on just in Algeria. Is when a country uh, produces oil and gas, whatever, the question of what volume do you produce, how much, how much do you encourage foreign companies to search for oil, uh, what do you do? So there are all kinds of rules which countries can invent if they find so much oil and that they export so much oil or gas, they want to have so many years of reserves, of proven reserves, in their reserves to be sure that they come for the next 30, 40 years. And there were, you know, the, every country devises its own sort of mathematical formula. This is not particularly original to Algeria. What is interesting is that there was a plan to have a huge development of Algerian oil and gas in the 1970s, pushed by the Americans, and which was at one point installed and was stopped uh, in 1979 when President Chedney came to power. Then in 1991, before the elections which were aborted and which started the Civil War, um, the Algeria's <coughs> public foreign finances were in such a dire state because Algeria is paying 100% of its export income to service its foreign debt. So the Prime Minister of the day, who presided over these ill-fated elections, Mr. Khouzadi, who was the former Minister of Energy, one day got up and he just said, well, I think we're going to sell Hassim Issaou to foreign companies. And that caused absolutely, you can imagine the kind of our pro it led to, so that was stalled. And then here again we get in 2005 American backing, a push to have very liberal rules and really push your production very, very much. And this poses questions which you find in other countries. I mean, if you look at Algeria, what Algeria is earning from its oil and gas and all the money is put aside. The question is, <coughs> what are you doing with this money? <coughs> You're earning this money, are you developing the economy? Are you spending it on something else than oil and gas? Or are you just producing oil and making money? Uh, and uh, why be nice to the Americans? Whatever. I mean, these are serious debates. So, for the moment, we've reached the stage, I mean, since this aborted new law, uh, that conditions for oil companies are not easy in Algeria. Whether they're uniquely difficult, I would hesitate to say, but then anyway, uh, this debate goes on, but it goes on among in Algeria than exporting. At that point, it's really dangerous. You're onto uh, hiding to nothing it's, you know, in terms of your security. So all these debates going on about oil and gas and everything are, are conducted behind closed doors, <coughs> which doesn't stop some articles and some people from writing some very good pieces on them. But it's not. There is no public policy debate, and. Uh, this is all the more worrying because, first of all, two-thirds of Algeria's territory have not been explored. So when you look at where they found new wealth, there's probably much more oil and gas in Algeria than you know, we think today. It looks as if the sea in front of Algeria might be a big gas field, which you know, would be a good thing or a bad thing with anybody. You know. And then on top of that, we have uh, shale gas. And the estimates there, I, actually I couldn't remember whether they were five times or ten times the size of the conventional gas. I mean, they're huge. Algeria has huge reserves of shale gas. So the problem there, as always in oil producing, I mean, what do you do with all this money? What's the point of extracting if you don't have an economic policy which is developing other industries? So the oil and gas of Algeria really are at the center everything, every debate in Algeria is directly or indirectly. Um, it's um, obviously in 
Tunisia, the story is different because Tunisia has always been a minor producer of oil and gas, so depending on, on the years, between a third and three quarters of its needs could be met by its internal um, uh, production. But the Tunisians, because they were they're small producers, have always had to have a very flexible policy towards exploration and production. And they've always been extremely flexible, not accommodating the foreigners, but always very flexible, very predictable, and therefore any number of small companies are working in Tunisia and keeping the levels of production up. In Morocco, for the moment, we have a legislation which is very flexible, very open, because obviously the Moroccans are desperate to find some oil and gas. They feel a bit cheated by the fact that the neighbor to the west, east has a lot of oil and gas, and they don't have any. Um, so for the moment, <coughs> Morocco has a very a flexible and open legislation in terms of trying to attract foreign companies. But then one must say that in Morocco, where the economy is more diversified than Algeria, the laws governing foreign investment are reasonably friendly to the foreign investor. So that wouldn't be anything particularly new. Um, but maybe I'll conclude on this, is that Algeria does face some very serious challenges on how it manages its oil and gas. What does it develop? What doesn't it develop? To what extent does it want foreigners involved? Um, here as elsewhere can one have rules which at least last for five years not not change every second or third year and on top of this what happened at Inaminas has had an impact in the sense that western companies or from companies from anywhere are being much more how can I say not rigorous but are demanding more guarantees about security they're, they're making life more difficult and uh, clearly the Algerians are not entirely convinced, a number of Western companies, that they've taken all the necessary um, measures to ensure security. Um, so it is a very, it's a moment of flux, it's a moment of great uncertainty. Um, <coughs> I, I have no idea what the future will, um, um, will look like. Um, Algeria will remain a major producer of oil and gas. But exactly how relations will, will play out uh, with foreign partners will it'll depend very much on the question of internal politics um, in Algeria. It won't depend very much on, 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 on the foreigners because there's no doubt there's a certain number of companies if they feel that the conditions for exploration are not good enough and on top of it there are doubts about security. Uh, and it, security costs a lot of money. I'm sure it's cost BP, Statoil, and others a lot of money to reinforce their security in Algeria following the Inaminas, um, uh, the attack on Inaminas. So we are very much in a state of flux and uncertainty today about what this policy will look like uh, two or three years uh, down the line. I think maybe I should stop there. That again. Well, thank you very much, Francis. Um, I'm going to exercise my prerogative of asking the first question. Um, you talk about Algeria remaining a major producer of oil and gas. Uh, currently, what is uh, exports count for how much? Mm -hmm. Oil and gas count for how much? What percentage of exports of government earnings? About 90, 95%? You mentioned the Shell Revolution um, in the United States, particularly also in other parts of in Europe, in Poland and elsewhere, uh, which might lead to depression of prices. If Algeria is still so dependent on oil and gas exports for paying its bills, and the market is challenged by renewables, demand might fall at some stage. Um, what's Algeria's alternatives? What, what else can it do if it doesn't have oil and gas revenues on which it's relied up till now? Well, I the remember... Population growing by whatever, how many million a year? Well, 22, 23 years ago when Algeria was going through a period of uh, economic reforms, uh, 
I, uh, I asked one of the sidekicks of the then Prime Minister, Mr. Hamrush, uh, what he thought a decent price for oil and gas, uh, for, for oil would be for Algeria. And he said, to me, he said to me, the answer was very direct. He said, you know, to succeed in our reforms, I hope the price drops below $10 a barrel and stays there for a few years. So there we are. I have nothing to add to that. Yeah. Right. Questions? Yeah. Um, a question that, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, basically what you're saying is that you need to arrive to a fracture before something actually gets done. Because through the history of the government, it's really been shown that the status quo is a beautiful thing, right? So we are living in a subsidized economy. Everything is subsidized. So the fact that there's more reserve in, in fracking and, uh, and offshore and everything, that's just going to perpetuate that. The only time that reforms were passed were late 80s or when they were struggling, and more recently in 99, when they passed the law for foreign direct investments, that they quickly changed in 2009 after the price of oil went up. Because there's a there's not a laissez fair attitude. There's really wanting traditional having a hold from the authorities, the government, everybody involved. My question, so that we know, my question with your experience, because it's something that even as, as Algerians would have a hard time to grasp uh, within the, the broader scheme, it's like how, just instinctively and also through your experience and your research, how corrupt is Algeria? I mean, I think Algeria, you know, or any country, <coughs> any country, well, how corrupt is Algeria? You, um, if you look at any oil producing country, you look around the world and you say, which is more or less uh, corrupt? You know, if you have a, if you have something like oil, exactly like you, if you have the gold or the silver from Latin America during the Spanish Empire, when you have huge sources of income, that does lead to um, that, that, does, uh, that does lead to, to corruption. And you can see, but it doesn't only affect uh, the, um, it, it affects the oil producers. But in the Arab world, it affects everybody. But if you look at the capital flight from North Africa, you'll find that uh, in the late 2000s, just before 2010, the capital flight from Tunisia, uh, when you related it to GDP, was even higher than Algeria. But clearly, there are a lot of money goes sideways, it's obvious. You know, what goes sideways, well, it goes abroad. It just goes abroad. And I don't see, and when you look at oil producers, I'm not speaking of Britain or Norway or whatever, but if you look at the Arab world, if you look at Nigeria, if you look at Venezuela, if you look at Indonesia, <coughs> you know, the story is very similar right across the board. Uh, and I, how you change this, I don't know. I, I really I have no idea. I've attended so many seminars on management of resources, transparency. Uh, and this goes on everywhere, but the point is it doesn't, it doesn't just go on when you're producing oil. <coughs> if you look at the flight of capital from Morocco, the amount of capital leaving Morocco is pretty high. You know, obviously, it's less than leaving Algeria because the income is much lower, but the flight, capital flight is pretty high. Uh, and I, you know, then depending on the, your political situation, you can say, well, the West is complicit in this or this or that, and I, whatever the, you know, the arguments, it's like the arguments about trying to recover the assets of Mr. Ben Ali or Mr. Kedafi or whoever, you know, you, the government's trying to recover them, and then they come to the West and they just find that, in fact, it's virtually impossible to recover uh, these assets. And I, free, I really, at this stage, I do not, I have no idea what you do. Um, I think you can be more or less corrupt, more or less well managed. Uh, but at the end of the day, it probably comes down to the countries themselves. Whether the West can play a role in that or not, I, I, I don't know on this question. I mean, put to you, I, I, I have some doubt. I have some doubt. Because it's sure that money buys a lot of things, and not just in Algeria or the Arab countries, but in the West. A lot of things are for sale, which were not for sale 30, 40 years ago. So um, uh, maybe, you know, uh, how often has one spoken of the curse of oil? You could have the curse of something else. Uh, you, 
the Spanish Empire died part of it the curse of silver, of the silver of, uh, of the Potosi. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, the, the, this, this, uh, any natural resource which is there, which can be extracted quite easily, not to say that the oil and gas in Algeria, the solar track has got brilliant engineers, they all work on transforming the oil and gas. This is serious, this is not nothing. But unfortunately, the policy, there's never been over a period of a few more than a few months or so few years any policy to really encourage private or to give private investment on some things that has been <coughs> agriculture that has been some efforts the last 10 years is much more conduce being made in Algeria today for private people. But when it comes to industry, as you, as you say, the problem is you subsidize everything. And in Algeria, a lot of things are subsidized. You just have to look at the import bill. The import bill is now very close to the export bill. The import bill has just been rising and rising and rising and rising. And if you go to Algeria, you go to a supermarket near Algiers, and you find all kinds of fancy French cheeses, all kinds of things. Like, really does Algeria, can Algeria not survive without importing expensive French products and all kinds of things which probably we could live perfectly well without? That is a question which I, I don't know whether it will ever change. I, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm not very hopeful because, as I say, it's not just in Algeria. It is in most countries. Uh, you know, that, uh, if you look at the subsidies, for instance, if there have been comparisons made now with the subsidies provided by cheap oil, cheap gas, cheap electricity um, across <coughs> the, uh, the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, even in the Gulf of Saudi Arabia. The position is untenable, though, in the medium term. You can't continue producing, selling electricity for nothing, using your own gas. Uh, you know, at one point, something will come unhinged. So it's a general problem. And I, you know, unless you get in Algeria a realization at the top of the decision that something's got to be changed, and this happened in 1989, will it happen again? Whether you're a pessimist or an optimist? Uh, I, I, I just don't know because I can't see the future five years now. I'm not, I'm not just in Algeria. I, mean, I, I have no idea, you know, uh, whether a new group of reformers or whether the system, number of people who are running the system, will understand that for their own good, for their own survival, they should introduce reforms. I, I have my doubts. Um, on, I can I'll take the. One, do I just make one comment about um, uh, use of resources? I mean, Norway is always held up to be the, the, the model for uh, countries, hydrocarbon states, using their resources to the to, uh, long-term benefit of the people. And uh, they adopted the ideas of an, a refugee from Basra, um, an Iraqi oil engineer who came um, uh, to seek medical um, help for his son. Um, and he walked into the Minister of, um, of Petroleum, or it wasn't the Minister of Petroleum, one the Minister, Minister of Industry, and said, what you need to do is establish a, a wealth, sovereign wealth fund for, your, for, for the long-term welfare of the people. And so Norway is held up always as, as, as the most successful developer. Um, and Nigeria at the other end of the uh, scale. Anyway, so I, can I ask one question here, and another at the same time, we'll take two together. Kind of answer. Thank you for the insights. And following from the last point, and um, sort of points on the subsidy, subsidies, and I was wondering if you could share any other experiences in the developing world where subsidy reform has been um, you know, positive or successful. And um, like I say, specifically on resource rich countries in the development world. Do you have any Well, in the case of uh, there's one country which I actually don't know. Uh, you know, in, in Iran, they increased the prices for a number of goods and started helping people directly. But I don't know whether that's led to, I have no idea whether that's really worked or not. Because, uh, for instance, petrol in Iran is, or, or get, no, sorry, gas in Iran costs six, I think it's six dollars per millimeter year in Algeria, they're upon five. But I don't know Iran. And, the, and this was quoted as an example of what the Iranians were doing, but I really don't know. And then the idea was to help families directly, you know, sort of, which is, all, which is, you know, which is an argument you get in the West as well. Uh, but there is no doubt that subsidies are hugely wasteful. 
And if you look at the subsidies on food, for instance, in Tunisia or Morocco, everybody benefits from them. But I mean, about 30% of Tunisians don't need subsidized food, about 30% of Morocco doesn't need subsidized food, so it leads to enormous wastage of bread, of couscous, all this kind of thing. So it's not just on, um, it's not just on, on, on petroleum, but then governments get addicted, I think, to this because it's so easy to avoid having to make a decision. And of course, since the fall of Ben Ali, uh, all Arab leaders are on tent hooks and worried that it might happen in their backyard. You know? So this leads to a kind of, uh, right, let's throw more money. But one, one day there will be a reckoning because the price, as I say, when you look at Algeria, 2020, if we continue like this, exports are less than domestic consumption point people start getting really worried. Um, the smuggling is already on a scale. What's happened in the last two or three years is quite extraordinary. I mean, in Tunisia, until the rebel, until the fall of Ben Ali, you couldn't buy Algerian petrol in Tunisia. It's just so. And then within six months, in the towns on the frontier, on the uh, western frontier of Tunisia, you started getting the uh, jelly can, you know, five, ten litres. When I went back to the frontier in April this year, you now had, you've got plastic, I don't know what the jelly can is, 20, 50 litres literally piled up on top of it in the middle of town. If ever there's an accident or something happens, the whole town blows. And now, and now it's not just in the frontier towns. You go to central Tunisia, you go to Sfax, you go everywhere, and you, it's got much better. I, I, I was shown by a friend in, in Tunis in the, on the edge of the mid now where you can, you can you go and see somebody and you say, by the way, uh, I'm going to this town and I want uh, 50 or 60 litres of uh, Algerian petrol or petrol at this price. And uh, so, so you pay him and then he sends a text to and you pick it up on the down the road. So, I mean, you know, the whole thing has been, it's now, it's a real, a real network and in Tunisia. They're going to have problems dismantling it. I don't know how it works in Morocco. But in, in Tunis, in, uh, in uh, at one of the gates of the old city, but there's a whole group of people who are clear. It's kind of it's like a stock exchange. They're trading, they're trading uh, petrol around right into Libya and doing all kinds of things. And once that takes on, that once that gets a grip, I mean, how do you stop it? So, it, it, you know, these subsidies have all kinds of funny things. And it's not a new, it's not a new story in that part of the world, like indeed elsewhere. I mean, I remember in uh, 1981, when was it, there was Gaddafi had attempted to uh, uh, cause trouble in Tunisia by sending some guerrillas or whatever it was into the southern town of Gafsa, but they went through Algeria, and Shadli ben had just become uh, president, and he did not know this was happening. It was done under the aegis of a former head of security of the Humidian period, so these people went across to uh, Algeria. And they attacked, I can't remember how many they were now, they were 50 or 100, they attacked the town of Gafsa one bright morning. And the battle, it took two or three days to dislodge them. The, the Tunisians had to call the French army. And I went down a few weeks later to see the Wali, the governor of Gafsa, and I was served with some excellent coffee. And in those days in Tunis, uh, coffee was very bad, and it was half crushed chickpeas, you know, and all that. And I, I said to him, uh, the governor, this coffee is excellent. How do you manage to get such good coffee? And so he just looked at the map, and on the, about 150 kilometers from Gafsa, it's the Algerian town of El Oued. And he said, Monsieur El Oued, la capitale algérienne du café. All the coffee was coming from Algeria. And if you go on the Moroccan side, it's the same story with coffee, with this, with that. In the, when the country, about 15 years ago, on the frontier of Algeria and Morocco, I discovered something extraordinary, talking to a friend in Tlemcen, who was who made jewelry, who was a jeweler. I said, but how do you get your um, you've got gold at a cheaper price than in the market in Algiers? Well, he said, it's no problem, we get our gold from Morocco. Now how they got it, they made dromedaries swallow pieces of gold. I don't know, across the frontier. So, you know, people have enormous ingenuity, which is why you, you know, and, uh, unless you reform, and uh, unless you put things on, a, on an even keel, you're, 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 this, and this causes enormous damage, because it means you don't know what economy, you're running a bizarre economy, basically. That's what's happening. If you look, and, and this affects Algeria, is to some extent a bizarre economy, but so is Tunis. Tunisia today is 50% informal. Anything goes. 
Why? Because the customs in Tunis they are no longer function. It just comes in, goes out, whatever. So I think that the problem of oil and gas is maybe on a scale is worse because the figures are enormous and it does enormous damage. But in a way, they reflect problems in the economy, uh, broader problems in the economy. I mean, you could argue that Morocco has a more <coughs> rational economic policy because that has no oil and gas. So somewhere it's got to earn its living. It can't. The Moroccan start can't sit and wait for it to happen. They've got to work, they've got to be, be, go and build hotels, they've got to do something. But in Algeria, I'm not saying the people are capable of working, not at all. Which is contrary to what people believe. The private sector in Algeria, there are, I mean, a number of companies just, in fact, that import export business or import businesses. But there are companies in Algeria, privately run, which are extremely well run. There is, interesting enough, the biggest service provider in the oil and gas industry inside Algeria is an Algerian country, company, which is an absolutely, uh, it, it is a company run on the highest standards of, you could find in America or anywhere, and they're doing it despite everything in the oil business. Which one? And you look at their, uh, sorry? Which one? Which company? They're run by the family called Fischke, no, Red oh, But I mean, you, you go, you, when you look at the, this company does all kinds of things, and in particular, it's got a, a I know what's called in English, a Bazvi. In Hasimisau, they have a big base where they have hotels where they host all kinds of foreign companies who don't want to set up their own thing. So they set up the, you know, the infrastructure, the food, the flights to Madrid, and all this kind of thing. And you go on to that. Campus. It's like walking onto a Californian campus. It's quite <laughs> extraordinary. That's not exactly Sorry? California campus. No, 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 but I mean, if you've been, I've been there. I've been there. there. <laughs> what, to the no, no, it's no, but I mean, California. No, no, what I mean is when you go in there, you see, or when you've seen that company, you've seen it work all that, it, it's run. Yeah. It's very well run, very seriously, which shows the Algerians perfectly <coughs> capable, given certain conditions of running something very good. And it's very funny to see parts of Hassi Misoud nearby, which are badly run. Then you go there and everything works and everybody's polite and it, yeah. it's, it's really, it's, it's a pleasure. You know? <coughs> so there again, how much does the system allow this to happen? Then you've got private companies in Algeria, uh, you've got people who've got industries, and I, mean, I, I know a number of people who've got their industries who, are, who despite the difficult conditions, are running efficient industries. It's not easy at all. It's not easy at all. But there are a certain number of people. But then you come back to the eternal problem. Is the state going to have rules which make sense, which are clear, which are implemented fairly? I mean, you know, the eternal question which you get in many of these countries. Um, in answer to your question, um, where in the Middle East has have reforms been, or substitutes been lifted? I can't think of anywhere. Jordan, maybe. But I can't think of, yeah. So you've been waiting patiently. Yes, I mean, you focused especially on the question of domestic prices as uh, perhaps self-defeating for many reasons. So in the case of energy, perhaps they're not subsidized in the sense that they're still above the cost price. But in the case of food, that would be subsidized. And this causes problems that you described. But it seems to me this is a, a microscopic focus which is silent about the bigger issues that is if, for example if the subsidies are seen as necessary by the government to buy social peace especially since the uh, uprisings in other Arab countries then why does it need to buy social peace because something else is missing so so I wanted to open up this but what else is missing for example, democratic accountability, <coughs> economic development of a sort that would benefit most people. Why are those missing? For example, and what are the alternatives being discussed or not being discussed? For example, even with the current domestic crisis, the government still would have substantial funds to invest in something. And if it lowered if it raised the prices somewhat and justified this as necessary to increase the income for investment in something that would benefit the people, I mean, so 
such as uh, some, some kinds of industrialization that would provide higher skilled jobs and so on to uh, absorb the, the surplus of highly skilled people graduating from secondary school and universities, then this could be an interesting economic program. And then it wouldn't, the, the program wouldn't just be focusing on the domestic prices as if that would be the only problem. But I don't get any sense from your account of what are these options? Why does it, the government need to supply social peace? And what would be other ways of gaining public consent for some way to use the oil income, the fossil fuel income, in some beneficial way? Yes, well, I mean, you're posing a problem about the whole Middle East. I mean, you know, it's a question which is relevant everywhere. And it's a perfectly good question. I mean, you know, why not have an economic policy which creates more jobs, which uh, helps people develop their own businesses, and so on and so forth? And, uh, you know, that question is posed everywhere, and there is no answer. Because if you have a source of income which comes from a narrow source, it is a way of uh, maintaining control. Fair enough. And that's how, that's how it goes. And it's been going on for, very, uh, for a very long time. And, uh, you know, uh, and as for the need for reforms, I mean, there were reforms were attempted in a really serious way in Algeria once, 23 years ago. Unfortunately, they were unhinged. And which reform do you mean? You mean liberalization, which is a well, totally different agenda. That, that, I didn't mention that. Well, liberalization, what I mean is refer economic reforms which were aimed at encouraging people to, uh, to set up their own businesses, to do certain things, to be freer, to, uh, to do things much greater accountability, uh, having a modern central bank which was much more modeled on, on certain European things rather than a very secretive central bank, having debates about it, having serious blueprints for reforms. Uh, having all kinds of studies conducted to see amongst the state industries which ones really should be closed down because they were completely useless, which didn't mean to say one wasn't going to find jobs or try and do something socially, which companies could be reformed reasonably easily, all that. I mean, all this kind of work was done, and it was done before 1988, and then there was an attempt to implement it for two years, which basically well, it came on in for all kinds of reasons. Um, it, one of the things which unhinged it was that the price of uh, oil was, was dropping and that Algeria's foreign debt, uh, the service of the debt, absorbed all the country's foreign income. And so that was one of the reasons why it was unhinged. The other reason why it was unhinged is because the politics they the Algerians decided to liberalize politics, for want of a better word, and allow any number of parties to, uh, to, uh, to be set up. And so naturally, not one but two or three Islamist parties were founded. And then all the problems of society came out. And when you fought elections, <coughs> the elections in 1991, uh, I've never seen such confusion in my life. I covered them. I mean, it was just kind of free-for-all. And the problem there was very simple, is to conduct economic reforms when you have such a severe free and fair elections and the worst economic and social crisis you've had in 40 years. Well, it's, I never thought it would succeed, partly because it just seemed to me it just couldn't succeed in view of the circumstances. Whether it would have succeeded had the, the, bad, the price of oil been higher, the situation been easier, I, I do not know. Uh, the other point about the reforms, which is worth saying, is that the French certainly didn't uh, smile on them and try to put a few very nice banana skins under the feet of the reformers. And they because succeeded. 23 years ago. Yeah, why did the French oppose? Why? Because part of the French establishment couldn't stand the idea of a reform down the road. Couldn't stand it. Don't forget that the president of France at the time, Monsieur Mitterrand, was Minister of the Interior when the first shot was fired in the Algerian War of Liberation, and was Minister of Justice in 1956 when he had written instructions allowing extrajudicial killings in Algeria. So, you know, politics comes in, and so it's not as if it's all that. I mean, the reforms were attempted. They were failed for all kinds of reasons. I mean, the internal reasons were the most important. But one lesson it taught me when I look at what's been going on in the last few years 
is I'm very doubtful about all this cheerleading in the West about free and fair elections, not because I don't believe in free and fair elections, but I mean, you know, you get the impression, <laughs> even reading my form paper for which I worked with for 20 years, Financial Times, that you just have to cheer and cheer and cheer. Democracy is a bit like, you know, put a bit of Nescaf hot water and you'll produce a nice democracy. Well, it doesn't work that way. And what's so interesting today is you look at all the enthusiasm in the Western media about revolution, this and that, and today everybody's calmed down a bit because obviously it is much more complicated. And in the case when you speak about economic reforms, can one conduct economic reforms in a major economic imbalance of payments crisis? Maybe that, on the one hand, as I quoted an advisor, Mr. Hamrush, saying, I hope the price of the barrel will remain at $10, otherwise we won't move. But by the same token, if the price is at $100, they don't move either. So I frankly don't know what the answer is. But at the end of the day, I think that in Algeria, as everywhere else, either there'll be a conjuncture of events or people within Algeria, in the political system, amongst the leadership, whatever, who will understand that they've got to somehow put their house a bit more in order, or they won't. And, you know, I'm not foreigners, can, but the role foreigners can play, I'm much more doubtful than many people have been over the years about what foreigners can really do. I mean, I don't know how much they can really shape things. I mean, sure, they can help to top the regimes, but I mean, that doesn't get you very far. Um, I guess I mean, your <laughs> question is a wider question about all hydrocarbon states, isn't it? It's about what kind of, how, what kind of political um, system can exist when you've got a government which has, in effect, its hands on all the, on all the, all the money and it's, um, it, it buys people off. It doesn't have to levy taxes and gain the consent of people in that way. Well, there are many ways of buying people off. Yeah. The main way is low prices for common domestic mm -hmm. goods, then that's one particular strategy. That's me, yeah. Okay. There are anyway. other ways. More interesting. Yeah. Just to build on that discussion to respond to the question, what to do? Definitely there is something to do. Um, because I don't expect too much from this parasitic and sterile elite that is in Nigeria. Clearly they don't have a coherent economic policy as you said in your talk. And that's the main problem. So sometimes I just think about this foolish idea, maybe the best thing to do is just to shut down the oil and gas field and think about something else. Um, but fundamentally, the problem has to do with democratization. And for me, the renouncement of a development project that was initiated in the 60s and 70s, regardless of what we have to say about that project, its shortcomings, its mistakes, that project was um, an inspiring project. It had an industrial a strong industrialization policy that achieved so much. The main problem was by the 80s, that project was just rejected and put in the bin. And, a neo and our regime and the government embraced neoliberal policies. And for me, this is the fundamental problem. Neoliberal policies or liberalization, um, I don't want to go into an ideological argument here, but um, if you don't link it with a coherent vision that serves the people, it's not going to uh, solve the problem. So the question of subsidies or foreign investments needs to be linked to an economic vision. Let, let's just give uh, some uh, statistics here. In 1985, 26% um, uh, of the economy was industry. That percentage went down to 5% in 2009. That's a big issue. The oil is a curse on the economy. We need to diversify it. And, and the regime, which is ruling now, is an obstacle to do that. Um, and you have a question as well. I mean, I think yeah, we should yeah. have a discussion, but it's... Uh, you yeah, have a question. this was just a comment, but yeah. I can't... Uh, let me, uh, let me just say two or three things. When you say reform, do you mean neoliberal reform? Or do you mean counter neoliberal reform? That's why I'm uh, expressing uh, 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 what uh, you uh, mean by reform. Uh, to pick up on, I, I quite agree with you that one should not disparage the development programs which took place in the 60s, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but 
they were they were going badly wrong, you see. Some of the things which were done, some of the people who built those industries, I knew the person who built us, so they were remarkable people and people believed in it. Other things were going very badly wrong. Don't forget that in 1962 Algeria could feed itself. By the death of Boumidien, Algeria was importing 75% of what it was eating because the socialist policy on the land was an utter disaster. All these people who at independence were desperate to recover their land. I know, I know land title is complicated now, but not that they were desperate to recover their land, have their own land. No, they copied, they just took the Russian model and put it there. And the advisor of the president on agriculture, the advisor of President Boumedien, Mr. Huhat, whom I knew very well, a very nice man. And uh, one day, one of his sidekicks explained to me that Russia was the model for the development of agriculture. And he quoted Kiev to me. And luckily for me, when I was 20, I'd gone to Russia. So you know, the Russian model, you have to see it on the ground, right? And then Mr. Huhat, one day, we were having an argument. I said, you know, you really should go to England and have a look at the countryside. He went to England. He came back, he was completely flawed. He said, I never imagined it was something like that. I said, because I, I don't know what you're doing. So the agriculture was a complete mess. Right? And this was very serious because the effect it had on all kinds of people, <laughs> the lack of jobs, all kinds of things. And, right. and Algeria was, in, was the biggest importer of eggs in the world at the death of women yet, which is quite an achievement. But let's not forget, <laughs> from independence yeah. till the death of women was just 15 years. What I'm saying so is that some of the things done, done some of the things done, all the education was basically a very good thing. The health programs, all that were very good things. Some of the industry was well done. The agriculture was a disaster. Some of the, because you see, it's always this idea of thinking the government can do everything. So on the one hand, they were pride, they want to do something, fair enough. But when you go and build to a big cement plant, in, in El Asnam, and you end up by destroying the best orchards in Algeria over 150 kilometers, you have to, it's, a, it's an achievement of sorts, and that was just common sense, and they were warned, they were told a hundred times, no, no, why did you build very big factories? Well, part of it was ideological, because, you know, it was the, it was the days when you know, big plants and all that, but part of the reasons was money. Because the bigger the foreign contract, the more the percentage of commissions. And I mean, under Boumedien, the commissions were on the scale. See, when I remember having arguments with people in this country or elsewhere, people who were, you know, much more left or whatever Marxist I was, and they would say, Shadley is so corrupt. I said, sorry, do you want me to start with the contracts under Boumedien and the money? The people, for instance, to give you one example in London, the man who ran the factory tractor, the tractor factory in Constantine, a Kouf. In 78, there was some trouble. They, they gone and built a tractor factory where the tractors were too big and it didn't work. It was burning and stuff. It was very expensive. And then there was a big row. He ended up the following year in Chelsea with a house of his own. And I remember saying to Lachta Abrahimi, and then, you're, you're calling that economic development? I mean, come on. There, there were all kinds of stories. So, well, I quite agree with you that not all of this was bad or misdirected. I think some of it was very good, but you see, the mistakes made, which were not just corruption, but just grand visions, completely absurd things, because in El Asnam, you, know, you go and build, this is between Algiers and, and Oran, you go and build a huge cement plant, which never worked properly, and you destroy some of the most beautiful orchards in North Africa. Well, you have to take your hats off to them. What were they doing? They destroyed jobs, they destroyed everything, and it never worked properly. You go to Mustaganem, they built a paper factory. The water of the river got so poisoned that people were going to the beach were losing their hair. Women were, were aborting. I mean, come on, this was known, but of course you had to shut up. In those days, now you had to shut up completely. So the problem was that by the late 70s, when Boumedien died, the problem was that the leadership was incapable of having, among even private people would talk about this. And then but they, could, they were incapable of having a debate about it. They needed to reassess it, say, okay. This, this, this has gone well, this isn't going well. But that debate never took place. Now, it never took place for a number of reasons. One, because the people running the economy were, were ideological to an extent, I can tell you. I mean, I, I knew them. Some of them were quite extraordinary. And I had been to Russia twice. It was like talking to a Russian. You really couldn't get in a word side. It was just totally ideological. 
they would lie to your face. I mean, the things they would do, uh, which was, you know, it, you, you have to see how it happened. So they, could, they couldn't have a debate. So the people who tried reforming, when you say neoliberals, well, you know, to call Mr. Hamrush a neoliberal, I can tell you it doesn't mean anything because a number of people by 80 through 84 were trying to do something. Now, some of the people who did it in the early 90s, they, they didn't do it very well. But then, the team, which was collected at the presidency from late 1985 onwards by Mr. Hamrush, I can tell you it had some of the brightest people I ever met. And they were very nationalist Algerians. To call them neoliberals would do them a disservice because they were far smarter than that. No and one they is calling them produce... neoliberals. Sorry? No, that's a straw man argument. No one is calling anybody... No, no, but I mean, no, these are people who actually, they published, they did a study in five books, like a life form, which you might have seen, which was 500 pages of the state of the Algerian economy. And this was done with access to all the documents, every piece of information with the full backing of military security and everything. And you look at that document, and you know it's not a document which is very well known <laughs> even at the time. But when I brought it out and shown it to different people over the last ten years, they come out and say, "What a remarkable document!" The Algerians didn't need foreigners to tell them what was wrong or what was going well, but there was a, a course stuff, you know, mm -hmm. "La maison algérienne ne va pas." What do we do? It didn't mean that everything that had been done twenty years before was wrong. I mean, in the oil and gas industry, if you take the development of LNG and all that. People speak about the oil as if oil just gushed out of the ground and you just sold it abroad. But the oil and gas industry is a very sophisticated industry in the Algerians. Everybody recognized that Sonatrach, which is why the Khalil story is so sad, that Sonatrach, the engineers, the Algerians were capable of doing the most extraordinary things and they believed in it because it was the first years after independence. But you see, by the time Boumediene died, there was no freedom of anything. And in a country which had fought for its liberation the way Algeria did, this was a very upsetting thing. They paid a price, and here they were told to shut up. And they were tortured. They were. All this was, you couldn't, you know, in the late 70s, before Boumediene died, when you went to a dinner in a foreign embassy in Algiers, they would invite a few Algerian officials. And if one out of five turned up, it was a miracle. It was like Moscow. I knew Moscow at the time. It was that there was something, admittedly, it wasn't Russia, because the Algerians aren't Russian or whatever and the party of the FLN, whether it was really an ideological party or just, I don't know. But in any case, there was a need to reassess. And somehow, they did try and reassess. But they, they failed, well, they failed, they did try. But those who had been in charge under Boumediene fought tooth and nail. I mean, I had arguments with people. They really, when you wrote a piece trying to <coughs> analyze a sector or going to a certain town in Algeria and just writing a piece describing what was there, you'd then be called to account a few months later and say, Monsieur, you're an enemy of Algeria. I said, come on, can we go through the things? No, no, that's right. I was just trying to write to describe, and I wasn't being anti or pro. I was quite well aware that some of the things which were being done were good, but they would not take any criticism at all. It was perfect. That's the way Algeria did it. The West was out to do them. And yes, they had to do them. And one day, I gave a talk at the at, the, at Arzu, at the request of the vice president of Sonatrach in charge of Arzu, who was a pretty tough marksman, but very clever and very good man, Mr. Mazouni. And I said to all his cab, I said, you know, here we are in a country which spends its time vomiting the Western banks in America. But may I point out that Arzu has been built essentially with loans from Western banks which, of course, you, uh, you have interest on, and with technology from Britain and America, and then the British fell out because of economic weakness, uh, industrial weakness in the 70s, replaced by the Japanese. So could we just, for once, stop this business about saying the West wants to do you in? Can we actually look at how the industry was built? And in those years in Arzu, there were more than a 1,000 Americans working, working. There was an American school. This was at a time when America and uh, Algeria did not even have diplomatic relations following the 1967 war. There was a charge in affair. And all the Americans in Arzu and in Ohal, that they got on the Texans, got on with Algerians like a house on fire. And that was a very good job. Where the job was badly done was that for Arzu, some attract literally the Minister of Energy or the Minister of the Interior literally grabbed part of the water of Ohal. So 
oh, it was short of water for 20 years. And no, you couldn't even say that. No, no, we just took the water. Right. So some things were rational and well done. Other things were totally irrational. And it led to all kinds of problems. And in a country like Algeria, as I say, when you've had a war of independence like Algeria had had, when you'd had the fact that many Algerians had been in France, and the Algerians wanted to talk, they wanted to argue. They were just gagged. They were told to shut up. So, of course, by the 80s, the debate became, they, they never managed to have a real debate. So, you know, I think that what you're saying, I agree with some of it, but don't underestimate the problems by the late 70s. Because years later, a number of the senior Boumedien people would say to me, you've been too critical of us. We were about to have a debate, but he died. And I said, the fat lot of use that is. The guy died, and you didn't have the debate. So, what could have happened had he lived? I never met him, and I don't know. And that cut across another argument, because I had a number of people saying to me, do you realize how stupid Shedley is? And I said, well, you know, Shedley's got a lot of defects, but I'm afraid I have met him a number of times, and I've had long discussions with him. Stupid he's not. You can, there are all kinds of things you can say about him. He wasn't a very hard worker, all kinds of things. But stupid, no. And people, and these arguments still come out in debates in Algeria. Somebody said to me, almost again a year ago, said, do you realize how stupid Shedley was? The guy who spent five, I said, did you ever meet him? He said, no. He said, he goes on about Mouigny. I said, did you ever meet him? No. I said, well, let me just tell you a conversation with President Shadi, and I'll just describe it to you. And they were mesmerized. I said, if you can't talk, you see, you can't talk about the history of this country, because once we've generalized about oil, the curse of oil, and all this kind of thing, you've got to sequence things. You've got to tell the story of the country. There was a story, and it's not all bad. It, there are things which were done which were remarkable. but. We could come back to democracy, and I would say simply, I don't like using the word democracy, but there is no doubt that in a country like Algeria, the fact that people were gagged, that you just couldn't speak in the late boom at the end and indeed it continued afterwards, that was terrible. Because here were people being educated, people who'd lived under, who'd fought the French, who were not stupid, you know, who were difficult to argue with Algerians sometimes, which are the best arguments of my life I've had in Algeria. People like arguing, they want to listen, they want to understand but they weren't allowed to. And even in the leadership, the way they argued, you cannot imagine the stupidity of some of the debates. They, they, it was tending to dirty X or Y, or to say he was corrupt or whatever, but to have a debate. When the Cahier de la Réforme was published, and you know full well that the man who oversaw that huge job became governor of Central Bank in 1989, when he would go and then talk in certain companies in Algeria to try and get a debate, so often the Boumedienis would just try and dirty his name because they couldn't, they couldn't argue. And even with the man who ran Arzu, who was an ardent left-winger, Marxist, but a remarkable engineer, and being a mujahideen, it took me 20 years. We got on very well because I argued against him and he respected me for that. But it took 20 years for me to be able to say to him, come on this, it was wrong. He said, yes, but we couldn't admit it at the time. That there was an incapacity to have a debate we can't go into the reasons why. At a time when a lot of people wanted to understand, they wanted to find a better way, but agriculture was a disaster. There was a shortage of water everywhere in Algeria, talking about shortage of water. No, 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 we're going to build another factory, we're going to do another thing. And what about the water? No, 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 it, the water doesn't exist. In Algiers, do you know what happened in Algiers? The shortage of water was so bad, I discovered, I used to go to hotels, from time to time I went to private friends' houses. And I discovered that one friend always had water. This was in his life. Whereas the next week didn't have water. And so I said to him one day, I said, how come you have water? Ah, he said, well, the former head of security, Mr. Kirsten Nalbine, lives nearby. And so the pipe should be rearranged now. Yes, if you're next to a colonel, a general, X, Y, you get water. So I, the next few years when I went to Algeria, I made quite sure that I was always staying in houses where there was water. I mean, you know, when you get to situations of, of it's, it's absurd, but it's also sad. Because you, you see, it, that's where even the good things of Boumedien were then decried because of, because I don't know if the responsibility of Boumedien and maybe in view of the nature of Algerian independence and all that, you couldn't have done better. I mean, I, I, that, that's, you know, development is complicated, it's difficult. But the gagging of people, uh, without going to democracy, I'd say, if you gag people, you will always get the same problem. It happens again. I saw it happen in Tunisia. In the 1980s, we hadn't talked about opened up the system. We wouldn't have the problems we have today. 
No, here was one of the most educated Arab countries where women had been given equal rights in 57. They were told to shut up. But they wanted to understand what was going on. They wanted to discuss. And it wasn't just a question of corruption. It was this attitude which you get in the Mediterranean, not just amongst the Arabs. I'm French. You get it in France, you get it in Spain, even in Spain, in Italy. When you're in front of the boss or the senior guy, you just shut up and you wait for incapacity to debate. And so there we are, and I'm afraid, um, you know, the, and, and debating, as I say, debating in Algeria, I can tell you, is a tough job, sometimes in front of students. I've enjoyed myself, but sometimes I, I've got quite cross, but they, people want to understand, they want to explain. When you give a conference on economic development, I do it up to 1989, you, people are very, very interested. And whenever somebody gets up and says, oh, you know, X was a shit or X was corrupt, I said, sorry, did you know the person? He's corrupt. He's corrupt. Did you know? I've, I've had to see it again and again and again where people, you know, they, they, they've become so sort of focalized on personality and they don't know anything about it because where are the documents? I mean, today in Algeria, or in the last few years, there, for all the faults of the press and censorship in Algeria, there are people who, who write. There are people who analyze economically and otherwise. So that there, there is a, a degree of, in, of, of freedom which is greater than many people think. But at the same time, people get very confused because the history of Algeria in the last 15, 20 years has been a very, very difficult one. It's been a very polarizing one. You know, when during the elections of 1991, you tried to look at the economic options. And so I was one of the few people I decided to do a piece on the economic policy of the Islamic Salvation Front. And I'm afraid it was empty. There was nothing. It was totally vacuous. And so, you know, you're faced, and now I have the same problem in Tunisia. I try and look for the economic program of Mr. Hanoushi or the his government. So, yeah, it's, there's nothing. There's absolutely, it's totally empty. And so, it's, it's not easy. And uh, I think that what you're saying about development, I mean, the Algerians used to love these debates because this was in the 60s and 70s, you know, sort of, yes, the state should do everything, and then the development of the central periphery, and you had endless ideological debates. But then one day saying to the, the president, if you had to get authority from the president, says, I'd like to go and visit a ferme de la Révolution Agraire, you know, sort of state, near Algiers. So permission is given. I have to dress up well because you're going to the presidency car with an advisor of the president. So we go off to a place near Algiers called Birkuta. And I'm allowed to attend a Conseil de la Révolution Agraire so long as I don't report it. But I, I, I said yes because I just wanted to see it. I've never seen such a ridiculous scene in all my life. They're all shouting at each other. Nothing to do with agriculture. It's purely ideological score for it. Wait a score. Wait. And then at the end, it was a lovely summer evening, I thought to myself, okay, what do I do next? So I get out, and then there was a hill, and I thought, I said to one of the farmers, the fiddlers, I said, um, let's walk up to the top of the hill and I want to look at the view. So the guy who was with me for the presidency was very puzzled. And then we walked through the field. I'll never forget it. I'm very well dressed. But in the middle of the field, the, this old man stopped me and he said, you know, we've never seen somebody from the presidency cross a field on foot. Thank you very much. You know, it's, you know sorry, but the answer has been a bit long, but you know. We, uh, we've got about 15 more minutes, I think. And there are at least two more questions. Any more? If there's one, then you want, yes, can I have? Please. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Francis, for the good insight about uh, what is going on in Algeria. <laughs> and we'd like to really know a little bit what, uh, I mean, what, what's the future? We didn't talk a lot about the future. I mean, there are a lot of things happening at the moment. And uh, as you rightly mentioned, you said that there were, you know, there was a little opening and people are talking a little now compared to maybe 15, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And uh, as the gentleman said, uh, obviously we're talking about a country who's been free for 50 years. This is quite a sort of a young country. Um, I mean, I work a lot with British companies that are taken down to Algeria to introduce you to the opportunities of the business and partnership and all that. Uh, and the good, really positive thing I see about, about the country and its future is that the country has everything at the moment got the human resources, even if they're not qualified, and I do really ask our diaspora 
uh, abroad uh, to really participate in the development of the country which we are really working very hard to help them to canalize the energy uh, of this expertise we have of the Algerians abroad to participate on you know physically going down there and trying to do, to do something uh, as I said we have the human resources or at the moment financial resources and we've got uh, I mean everything is there the know-how is a problem and we need to really see or find a way of really pushing the, the know-how towards a country to make sort of the things work better. I mean, you mentioned about the... the, 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 the We've got a question. Yeah, yeah the question is, uh, uh, if we think about maybe, we talked about the economic policies and maybe the vision is not there, what can we do with all what we have, as we can see that there is everything there, what is your view about the best way forward? I think a lot will depend on the, that there's a transition of generations, which is happening or going to happen. Shall we, shall we wait for another 30, 40 well, yeah, years without doing anything? You know, revolu <laughs> revolutions produce people who are convinced that they're right for the rest of the It's optically unique, it may be sad, but that's, that's happened everywhere. And the question of who's going to emerge in the next generation is one thing. The question of leadership is, is a very difficult one, because you know whether le leaders with a vision and the capacity to convince others of their vision, whether that emerges or not is one of the great mysteries of human history. It happens or it doesn't happen. There are moments when suddenly le leaders get thrown up, people get thrown up who, who do mark a time, other times when it doesn't happen. And I, I really don't have the answer to that one. And you can look right around you and uh, see, see if uh, well, we can have some idea. But I do believe that leadership or a group of people very convinced and prepared to take risks does matter. I have no idea whether now that might happen or not. When the reformers emerged in 1981, in 1989, it was a, I can tell you, in the West, very funnily enough, amongst people who knew are very, very well, it was an enormous surprise to see these people. Uh, the, some people couldn't convince themselves they were real reformers. <coughs> And of course, the game of dirtying them happened very quickly. But they did emerge, they didn't succeed, but there were some remarkable people among that group. And uh, right, they failed for all kinds of reasons. Will this happen again? I, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, for, yes, so uh, the usual thing anyone who thinks they've got a crystal ball <laughs> or about the Middle East ends up with a hand of empty uh, broken glass. You've got, yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad that you spoke uh, about the Brunelian era because it's, uh, it's a period that was, uh, that is today uh, almost romanticized. I don't know if you see that, but it's, it, what's amazing, it's at uh, all, uh, all levels of society. There's an, uh, almost a deification, and I was, there was no torture now in the Brunelian, there was nothing, everything was fine, we had food, we had blah, blah, blah. Are you, are you shocked by that, or is that? I mean, do you, how do you? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not, because Algeria she has been through. When you've been through what Algeria has been through since 1992, uh, of course you you try and find uh, you know a very very harsh war after 130 years, a very harsh colonization, and then the bloodletting starts again 30 years after independence. That's tough by any standards. And so people get lost, they can't find a narrative. And the narrative they were offered in the 70s, you know, narratives of liberation or freedom, that, that's true everywhere. You have to invent a myth. Every country has to invent a myth of itself. And the myth works more or less well or whatever. But the, what was invented in the, in the 1960s or 70s was probably unavoidable. But the people who, the people who, um, invented it also had a problem, they still have a problem today, is first of all, they, they, they alone, a few hundred thousand people, a few thousand people, were the only people who took Algeria from darkness into light. Well, it didn't happen that way. Or another fact, that, which I find very interesting, <coughs> during the War of Liberation, the women played a major role. During the, the troubles in the, eight, in the 90s, all these women who went, who 
there were doctors and lawyers and civil servants and nurses who went to work, particularly those dressed in European clothes, despite the risk of being assassinated in their staircases. And still today in Algeria, women do not have equal rights. That completely defeats me. And I must say that it's one question when I put in Algiers to some people, they are shut, they have no answer. I said, how can you 50 years after independence not have given women equal rights? I just do not understand. And funnily enough, I think I'll conclude on this. But to debate at the Institute of Strategic Studies in Algiers, which in the days when it was led by Mohammed Yazid, it was a place where you could have serious debates in private, right? and serious debates. And one day we were, I don't know, I was debating about reforms. It was bang in the middle of the reforms of the Hamrush government. And there were a lot of security militaire people there. And uh, one of them said to me, well, look, if, if there's one thing you could advise us to do, or we, you could advise Algeria to move forward, what would you suggest? And my words went faster than, well, not faster than my thoughts. I said, you know, you are a man, but I'm going to be very clear. You take half the senior people in Algeria who are men, you dump them into the sea and you replace them by women. And this came out and he looked at me, he was furious. But others applauded. And I, what I said, I meant. I mean, you know, in the, and this is true for the whole Arab world. I mean, this business, as long as this business continues, a number of things will not change. You know, and this is something, and it's fundamental, and these are things, as I say, I don't know how you do it, because I'm well aware that in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, women are getting more educated, are playing an important role, are becoming industrious, are doing all kinds of things. But whenever Tunisia was quoted as an example of women's emancipation of what Bourguiba did in 57, the one thing about that was interesting in the 90s was to say, when people were saying, oh, it's all the fault of Islam, we say, well, how come in an Islamic country did a man give women equal rights except in inheritance 20, 30 years before Catholic Italy, Catholic Spain, Catholic France. Tell me how he did it. And that at least gets rid of this argument, oh, it's the fault of Islam. So it was a good thing. But what Bourguiba did probably explains half the development of Tunisia in the last 40 years, if not more. And today in Tunisia, what is very interesting, when you look at the arguments, okay, some of it is violent and all that, but the women play a key role in trying to keep the temperature not too, too high. And it's a very important role. And in Algeria, I think it is one of the great sins of the rulers of Algeria that they never gave their women their rights. This is something, and it's irrespective of whether you think they should be fundamentalists or not fundamentalists. I once had an argument when one of the leaders of the, fund of the feast, Rabbi Kibir, when he was in exile in Germany. And I said, there's one thing I don't understand. You are saying women have got to be out of the public place, they've got to be at home. Fair enough. I said, and then you say in the same breath that you want to catch up on France, on England, on Germany in terms of economic and social development. I said, may I just point out to you that in Europe, the emancipation of women, which took a certain amount of time, but the emergence of women as major or equal actors in the, in the public field is one of the keys to everything that's happened in the West, in Europe or wherever, for the last 300 years. So I very, if you're going to tell me women should go back to home, that's your absolute right to say that to me. If you want to quote the prophet, you can quote the prophet. I'm not an expert on the prophet. It's none of my business. But don't tell me in the same breath you're going to catch up on England and France. And I must say, for once with an Islamist, he said, you know, I never thought of it that way, nothing. The conversation ended. But he did take the point. And so I said, do what you want. It's your country. But don't tell me that. And so, you know, yeah. there are a number of points of this kind, but it's, I think we're going to stop. So you said you're going to stop, and I'm going to give the last uh, word to a lady who's waiting to ask a question or make a comment. Um, yes, uh, uh, you said that you have met, uh, you know, um, some presidents in, in Algeria, obviously, uh, uh, but you haven't talked about Mr. Bouteflika. So I'd like... I've never met him. I mean, I've, ah, okay. I've, I've never met him. So <laughs> All right, okay. That's, I that's stopped, my, my career as a journalist stopped in 1995. Okay, so you haven't been... Uh, in the latter Boumedien years, okay. when I was a younger journalist, I, right. I did not... I concentrated when I joined the FT in 77, even before that, going to Algeria. Because the person who helped me a lot, it was very difficult to see people. The person who really helped me and pushed me was Lachdan Rahim, who was ambassador here. So I basically asked to see the oil and gas people, and the central bank. 
because I just decided that's where my, it's not that I wasn't interested in the rest, but so, and just to see the governor of Central Bank as a very young journalist in 1975 or 76 before joining the FT, or see the oil and gas people, I can tell you, it was an achievement of thought, but that was thanks to Lafda and one or two other people. So I just decided I would do that because if you started trying to see everybody, added to which, may I just point out one thing, is that Mr. Bouteflika was foreign minister, but he never ran the ministry. Mm -hmm. The ministry was run by somebody else whom I know personally, who's come from a great Camille family, very discreet. He was the key man. It was not Mr. Bouteflika. What's his name? No disrespect to Mr. Bouteflika, but it was somebody else. Right? So, I, and I knew that at the time, and I didn't, so you, you, in any case, you couldn't do everything. You know, when you're faced with a system like that, after that it became easy, I got to know people. In the windows.